Welcome, everybody. I'm the dean here at uh, Columbia Journalism School. Really glad to see such a strong crowd tonight. Um, on this, uh, the 20th anniversary of the 2018 J. Anthony Lucas Prize Award Ceremony, we've actually been celebrating the 20th anniversary all day. We had a wonderful event uh, at midday with Is Isabel Wilkerson, uh, the author of uh, Warmth of Other Suns, and she was brilliant. And we have other past winners here as well that I'll introduce in a minute. Um, tonight, in this uh, session, we'll hear from our, uh, we'll present four awards for excellent nonfiction writing, and then we'll hear from our winners during a panel discussion that I'll uh, moderate, and then we'll finish with uh, Jane Mayer and Jonathan Alter in conversation. Jane's been busy in the last couple of weeks. I hope most of you know that she authored the story about the former Attorney General of New York, so we'll, that will be a very interesting session. So one of the um, three Lucas Prize Project Awards, uh, the Mark Linton History Prize is named for the late Mark Linton, who was a senior executive at the firm Hunter Douglas in the Netherlands when he passed in 1997. And his wife, Marion Linton, and children Lily and Michael established the Mark Linton History Prize as part of the Lucas Prize project to, to honor him. And uh, he was an avid uh, reader of history. And the Linton family has generously underwritten the Lucas Prizes since its inception 20 years ago. Uh, in 1998. And Lily and Michael, I think, are here with us, if they would be recognized. Hi, Lily. Is Michael here also? Please, please stand up and thank you. And one of the uh, gifts that Lily has literally brought to the awards is this work in progress uh, prize, which is distinctive, I think, in all of uh, nonfiction prize giving and uh, really has made such an impact on so many fine writers and so many fine books. And this year, for the first time, we'll uh, honor two works in progress instead of one, with $25,000 grants uh, given to aid the completion of significant works of nonfiction on a topic of American political or social concern. So thank you, Lily, for your vision in expanding that part of the project. So uh, right now, we have a short video to show you about the origins of the awards and the life and legacy of, legacy of the great uh, writer and journalist J. Anthony Lucas. When people talk about book writing, they almost always talk about the process of writing, sitting there by the keyboard and writing it down. And it is in many respects not the most important, because the most important part is the reporting. Tony Lucas started as a newspaper reporter. He's an incredibly diligent reporter, and so you see the really old-fashioned devotion to fact. Tony's kind of work was detailed and serious, but also an entertaining yarn as well. He had this kind of set of ideas about nonfiction writing, and what he really hoped for was that there would be a sort of elevation of nonfiction book writing to the level of literature. Tony cared so much about the craft, but he really cared also about other people's work in this area. When Tony died, I went to Arthur Gill and said, you know, I want to do something to carry forward what Tony cared so passionately about. Let us congratulate our winners. So if you look at the people who've won this award in the past, David Marinus, Robert Caro, Samantha Power, Jane Mayer, David Finkel, and on and on, we think of them as in this kind of elite group of American authors who aspire to the kind of quality we see in Tony's work. Then there is what we call the Mark Linton History Prize, which is named for the late uh, Mark Linton. None of this would be possible without the support of the Linton family. And as we talked about what narrative nonfiction had meant to Tony, there emerged this idea of not just this one book award, but a work in progress award. When I got the award, it really allowed me to delve in more deeply, to take more time. And it also gave me this layer of institutional heft and legitimacy that, especially for a first-time author, it, it, it gave me confidence. The prize was so meaningful to me because his kind of work, narrative nonfiction that is both serious and incredibly entertaining, is exactly what I wanted to do when I grew up. What Tony Lucas did in his work, and many of our winners do in their work, is they blend storytelling 
with a social conscience. And the idea was to hold Tony and his work up as standard bearers uh, for authors. And if you look at the two decades now of prize winners, I think you can say the board has really done that. It's kind of a, a pantheon of excellence. So the Lucas uh, Prize project has grown to encompass, as I mentioned before, uh, not just the Mark Linton History Prize and the original book prize, also these Works in Progress Prize, and two $5,000 grants in addition to two of the strongest students in Sam Friedman's leg legendary book writing class at the graduate school here. And many of those students have gone on to publish books that were developed in the class. Um, I'd also uh, note that the project is informed every year by the voluntary service of board members and judges who give lots of their time uh, to uphold the, the ideals that you just saw in the video. And I want to recognize board members who may be in attendance uh, today, Jonathan Alter, Shay Earhart, Linda Healy, Lily Linton again, Pamela Paul, and Abby Wright. Thank you for the time you give to keep this going. And I want to mention the judges, uh, some of whom are here this evening, for their dedication and for reviewing uh, many dozens of books to select the winners. Uh, if you're here, please stand. David Blum, Barbara Clark, John Duff, David Marinus, Ethan Michelli, Dale Rusikoff, William Schinker, and Elizabeth Taylor. Thank you all for your time. I really appreciate it. And there are a few past winners. I see one of them in the front row, Jane Mayer, I, Sherry Fink, uh, Masha Gessen, uh, Susan Suttard were on their way, if they reach it. Hi, Susan. Welcome back. So we share the stewardship of this project with the Neiman Foundation. You saw Anne-Marie Lipinski, their director, on the video. But uh, tonight we have her partner, James Geary, the deputy curator of the Neiman Foundation at Harvard, who will give out these awards. And so let me invite James up uh, to get us started. Hey, James. Uh, thank you very much, Steve. Um, welcome, everyone. It's an honor to be here on behalf of the Neiman Foundation to recognize um, this important work. We, be we begin with the J. Anthony Lucas Work in Progress Awards, which are given annually to aid the completion of a significant work of nonfiction on, top of, on a topic of American political or social concern. The judges this year were Barbara Clark, who was the chair, John Duff, and Chris Jackson. We have two winners. The first is Chris Hamby. He's an... <laughs> He's an investigative reporter for BuzzFeed News, based in Washington. He also won the 2014 Pulitzer Prize for investigative reporting. He's won the $25,000 award for his work, Soul Full of Coal Dust, the true story of an epic battle for justice. The judges said in their citation, Soul Full of Coal Dust combines meticulous, in-depth reporting and careful research with a sensitive portrayal of individuals afflicted with black lung disease, a scourge that still hasn't been eradicated. Chris Hamby's immersion in the lives of West Virginia miners and the courageous people trying to help them honors the work of J. Anthony Lucas by shining a light on the dangerous conditions endured by people in Appalachia, often forgotten, who see no better employment options than a life underground. The environmental and human costs of mining coal and the complicity of the insurance industry in preventing treatment staggers the mind and stirs the heart. Hamby's work in progress shows us that America's dependence on coal has implications beyond the merely theoretical. Please join me in congratulating Chris. Our second work in progress winner is Rachel Louise Snyder. <laughs> uh, 
She's a writer, professor, and public radio commentator um, who says she just paid the gentleman over there who uh, <laughs> applauded, who covers, <laughs> who covers domestic violence and previously worked as a foreign correspondent for Marketplace and has also contributed to All Things Considered and This American Life. She wins the $25,000 award for her work, No Visible Bruises, What We Don't Know About Violence Can Kill Us. The judges in their citation said, no visible bruises plunges readers into the nightmare world of American dom domestic violence. Rachel Louise Snyder's singular achievement is that she illuminates the dark corners of this specter as a way to understand it and thus eliminate it. Her perspective on the challenges faced by those who try to work within the system and on the role of factors such as drugs, unemployment, and teenage pregnancy point the way to possible solutions. In the best tradition of J. Anthony Lucas, Snyder participates in the story, capturing the big picture along with the telling details. As she says, what we don't know about violence can kill us. Her compassionate yet thorough examination of the problem promises to take the national conversation on this issue in a productive direction. Please join me in congratulating Rachel. We now turn to the Mark Linton History Prize, which is awarded annual, annually to a work of history on any subject that best combines intellectual distinction with felicity of expression. This year's judges were David Marinus, Etan McKaylee, Sylvia Nasser, and Elizabeth Taylor. This year's finalist is Prairie Fires, The American Dreams of Laura Ingalls Wilder by Carolyn Frazier. Frazier is the editor of the Library of America edition of Laura Ingle Wilder's Little House Books. The judge's citation reads, Carolyn Frazier has brilliant, brilliantly recast our understanding of Laura Ingle Wilder's life and times and affirmed her influence in shaping the myth of the iconic West. Extensively researched, Prairie Fires reflects Frazier's deep knowledge of westward expansion and captures the full arc of Laura Ingalls Wilder's life in three acts, poverty, struggle, and reinvention. Frazier illuminates how Wilder's, Wilder's wildly popular Little House, Little House series was a profound act of American myth-making and self-transformation by a woman who had reimagined her frontier life as epic and uplifting, with disappointment and loss transformed into parable. Frazier keys into the vexed relationship between Wilder and her daughter Rose, a profligate, a profligate tabloid journalist prone to dramatic mood swings, and locates a dark libertarian strain running through the family. This biography considers a cultural touch, touchstone, The Little House on the Prairie, and magnificently places it in the American experience and imagination. Caroline, unfortunately, could not be here tonight, so we move on to this year's winner, Stephen Kotkin a professor in history and international affairs at Princeton. And he's won for his definitive biography of Joseph Stalin, the second volume in a trilogy, From Collectivization and the Great Terror to the Conflict with Hitler's Germany. The title of the book is Stalin, Waiting for Hitler, 1929 to 1941. The judge's citation reads, a stunning achievement. Stephen Kotkin's St Stalin reveals with precision and clarity the period in which the impatient dictator developed into a monster who used his authoritarian rule and coercive power to manipulate social divisions, invent enemies, and forge despotism in mass bloodshed. Through his prodigious research and command of an immense body of new documents, Kotkin comprehensively documents jo Joseph Stalin's rule and his remaking of the USSR into an empire. And he gets inside the mind of a tyrant whose murderous obsessions led him to execute nearly a million people. This second volume of Kotkin's planned trilogy deepens understanding of the turbulent, tragic period ju by juxtaposing Stalin's extension of influence in the Soviet Union with Adolf Hitler's rise in Germany, culminating in the most disastrous conf conflagration in modern history. In a landmark work of historical scholarship, Kotkin has written a captivating biography. 
of a despot that chronicles the evolution of Stalin as a human being, political operator, and growing arch fiend in this horrific era of modern history. Please join me in congratulating Stephen. Lastly, the J. Anthony Lucas Book Prize is presented to a book-length work of narrative nonfiction on a topic of American social or political concern that exemplifies the literary grace, commitment to serious reporting, and social responsibility that characterize the distinguished work of the award's namesake. This year's judges were William Schinker, who was also the chair, David Blum, and Dale Rusikoff. This year's finalist is Jessica Bruder for her book, Nomadland, Surviving America in the 21st Century, which exposes the dark underbelly of the American economy through the transient lives of a new low-cost labor pool made up largely of older Americans. Bruder is an award-winning writer who teaches at Columbia Journalism School. The judges wrote in their citation, if the best narrative nonfiction exists to take us to stirring places we've never been and to share a gripping, character-driven story, Jessica Bruder succeeded brilliantly with Nomadland, offering a powerful human perspective on the American condition as she sees it being tested at every turn. Bruder's epic journey in a white 1995 GMC Vandura van she dubbed Halen, Van Halen, <laughs> I, I think I see what she did there. Um, <laughs> she landed on wisdom that the last free space in America is a parking spot, and found a first-hand view into the new economy that has transformed our nation. Bruder's urgent rendering of our current crisis, alongside portraits of Americans finding new paths to fulfillment, has given us a work that transports us into the center of our country's beating heart. Please join me in congratulating Jessica. And finally, this year's winner is Amy Goldstein, a staff writer at the Washington Post for over 30 years for her book, Janesville, An American Story, an intimate account of the fallout from the closing of a General Motors assembly plant in Janesville, Wisconsin, and a larger story of the hollowing of the American middle class. The judges wrote in their citation, with vast sweep and stunning specificity, Amy Goldstein's Janesville chronicles the dissolution of the middle class in one mid Midwestern community that becomes emblematic of America itself. Goldstein begins with the 2008 closing of a General Motors plant that for 80 years buttressed the families and social fabric of Janesville. Then marshals shoe leather reporting and original social science into a panoramic portrait of workers, politicians, parents, teenagers, educators, business leaders, and a community struggling to find a way forward. As the subtitle aptly puts it, Janesville is an American story a triumph of narrative nonfiction in the tradition of J. Anthony Lucas. Unfortunately, Amy can't be with us tonight. She's uh, at a conference in New Zealand, but she did send some pre previously recorded remarks. Thank you very much. I wish I could thank you in person, though I'm glad that vital members of Team Janesville are in the room with you all. I am so grateful to Columbia Journalism School for this honor and I hadn't thought it would be possible to deepen my gratitude to the Neiman Foundation, which gave me a remarkable fellowship year in Cambridge, but Neiman has found a way. Winning the J. Anthony Lucas Book Prize is profoundly meaningful to me because of the values it stands for and the work of its namesake. When Common Ground was published, I was still in my 20s, and I received a copy as a gift. It was an excellent gift because not long before, I had been covering a school busing case at my first newspaper job in Norfolk, Virginia. So the terrain that Tony Lucas showed us, court-ordered school desegregation and its impact on people within a city, was familiar enough that it was easy for me to recognize how brilliant his book was. 
The idea of writing a book of my own crept up on me a few decades later during a different wrenching period, the Great Recession. I was noticing a lot of terrific journalism about the macro view, political fighting about President Obama's stimulus plan and whether the government should be rescuing auto manufacturers and banks. But I didn't see much writing about what it really was like for people to lose good jobs, what effect that trauma has on workers and families and the texture of a perfectly ordinary community. So I became obsessed with telling that story, focusing on one place as a microcosm, a metaphor. Janesville, Wisconsin is a small city with a proud industrial past. It was the home of the Parker Pen Company and it had the nation's oldest operating General Motors plant until it closed down two days before Christmas of 2008. And his people who were generous and patient with me over several years, so my gratitude also stretches to the people of Janesville. Fairly early in my work, as I was starting to think about how to make real people into characters and this elusive thing called narrative arc, I pulled my old copy of Common Ground off a bookshelf. Rereading it, I found it every bit as powerful as I had decades before and even more daunting because by then I was starting to understand a little more about what goes into writing a book. So to have been told by the Lucas Prizes that Janesville, an American story, is in the tradition of J. Anthony Lucas's work is an honor I will always treasure. Thanks so much. And it was a wonderful colleague at the Washington Post many years ago, and it's uh, amazing to see how that institution continues to support journalists who grow into achievements at book length like hers uh, from, from a newspaper uh, newsroom. So we're up here just for half an hour or so. I think my stop time is 7.25 or something like that. And uh, I want to leave some time for, for you to ask questions of these folks. So I'm going to go quickly down the row and start with Chris. So your work in progress really originates, I guess, in the investigative reporting you did that won the Pulitzer Prize a few years ago about the resurgence of black lung in coal country, um, a disease that we thought we had left behind. And you particularly focused on the, the kind of complicity of the medical profession and the legal profession in essentially preventing minors from uh, reaping the, the support they needed as they fell ill. So t talk to us a little bit about how you move from a deep investigative report like that into a book-length story, a narrative. I can see in the work in progress your strategy, but why don't you describe how you're, how you're making that transition and what it's been like so far? Well, even as, as massive as the series that we initially dropped was, and my editors can attest to that, it was many, many hours of editing, um, I felt like I'd only really scratched the surface of the major story here to tell. And that is basically that 50 years ago, we made a promise as the American people to this nation's coal miners that we were going to do everything that we could to eradicate black lung because we know how to do that. And that until then, we were gonna provide fair compensation for men who were stricken with the disease and women. And we still haven't done that 50 years later. And there are a lot of reasons why, but it's, it's nothing short of a national scandal, frankly. So moving from the series in which I kept adding on, hey, I wanna write this historic sidebar, and hey, I wanna write this uh, sidebar on a new frontier here, there was such a massive story to tell. And the characters, there were a few characters to me that really stood out from the series. And what I decided to do was just spend years reporting with them. So I've been following them since the series came out in 2013. I was with them before then. Um, so this is years and years of reporting on their struggles to get the benefits that they deserve. And it, it really has developed into this parallel narrative of two remarkable men. Uh, one, a young man from Western New York who came to the Southern West Virginia coal fields as a 22-year-old kid. Uh, and he was as a VISTA volunteer in the War on Poverty. And he ends up falling in love with the area and staying and becoming a carpenter and then a clinic worker and then a lay advocate for these miners and then a lawyer. And he ultimately intersects in an incredibly meaningful way with the life of my second primary character, who's Gary Fox, who's a coal miner. And uh, 
their lives uh, come together in a, a very uh, sort of tense matter to in a battle against the medical, uh, legal, and the coal industry, above all. Just say one word about the contracts that some of the coal interests developed with the medical profession to evaluate claims uh, of, of miners like your characters. Well, there are, it's not unusual that in litigation you have a, the usual stable, the usual suspects on either side here. But one thing, and this was something that really stood out with the initial series to me and that has stood out since and that is a significant thread in the book is that these are doctors at major institutions and their, their records are, quite frankly, they, if you examine them deeply, they just never find black lung, which is just implausible. Um, and then when you do the more reporting, you learn that, hey, they were actually proven wrong in these cases, but no one has been able to piece that all together. So that's what I've tried to do. And I think probably the most surprising thing from the initial series, which I've fleshed out uh, in much greater detail in the book, is um, that there was this group of radiologists at Johns Hopkins University um, that had a huge impact on literally thousands of miners' claims over 40 years and basically never found black lung disease. And these guys were all losing their claims in large part because of it. Um, and one of the characters in the book is a miner who we actually featured in the original story about that in the series. And I've continued to follow him um, since, including after his death and what his autopsy showed and definitively proved that doctor dead wrong. Very powerful. It was powerful then and it will be powerful in the book, I'm sure. So Rachel, no visible bruises. What we don't know about violence can kill us. I really enjoyed reading these uh, chapters and, and the framing of the book that you've created so far. You're rare in that you're both a scholar with pursuing kind of frontier of ideas and insights about domestic violence, but you're also a narrative writer who brings people and scene to life. So. Uh, Two questions on both ends of that work. You say at one point that we should think about domestic violence as a kind of public health crisis where we're failing to address, we're, we're failing to identify and do something about the obvious solutions to reduce um, that violence, and that if it were a disease, we would be much further along than we are because it's so complex socially. So, tell us a little bit about the big ideas that you are finding in your research that are either misunderstandings of the structure of domestic violence or potential ways to mitigate it that we're failing to act on. And then, then tell us a little bit about how you construct this as a story. What's your method for bringing these cases uh, to life and connecting them to the ideas that you're working with? So just a couple small questions. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, <laughs> I mean, I, I think like, like a lot of journalists, I had a very casual acquaintance with domestic violence. I was always interested in social issues, but I didn't separate that as a, as a uh, particularly vexing social issue. And in fact, I would go so far as to say that I, um, I thought, like most people, oh, it's just a private matter. Just that some woman just made a bad decision in marriage. That's too bad. Um, and I met a woman, the sister of the, of the novelist Andre Debuse. Her name is Suzanne Debuse. I met her on a Saturday afternoon one day. And um, I asked her what she did. She said, oh, I work in a domestic violence uh, you know, crisis center. I said, oh, that's, that's interesting. That seems bad. You know. And um, she said, yeah, we've just developed a program to predict domestic violence homicide before it happens. And I was like, wait, what? How can you do that? That seems crazy. And um, I ended up like following her around. Like she had to go grocery shopping, go to the farmer's market. And I was like, can I come with you? Can I please come with you and ask questions? Because I was so taken with the idea that you could um, address something that seemed unaddressable. And what I learned, she was very patient with me. And she said, you, you, know, you obviously know nothing. So, um, <laughs> So here are some books, and here are some people that you should talk to. And I spent, I think, two years just educating myself on 
the particulars, things like why victims don't leave or why um, when someone doesn't show up to renew a restraining order, those are the ones we should be more worried about, like things like that. Um, and then as I began to uncover it, I began to see that um, domestic violence is like a, is like a, and Jane, I'm, I'm not mad at you for, for scooping me on the, on the Schneiderman story. Beautiful, beautiful work. Um, but I began to see that domestic violence was uh, uh, like the front line to so many other forms of violence, including mass shootings. Um, there's huge numbers of, of um, mass shooters who have domestic violence in their backgrounds, and we're not taking it seriously. As law enforcement um, and the judiciary, we don't take any of that seriously. And it's, it's tricky, because you have to catch these things in the misdemeanor phase before they become escalated. And yet, the law has certain dictates that you have to follow. So um, I began to understand, I think, in a way, how domestic violence affects um, not just the individual families, but the communities that we're in. And um, all these other forms of violence, you know, 80% of the men in prison today have domestic violence in their backgrounds, either as witnesses or um, victims themselves. And so if we can address that, we can address so many other things. But I could never figure out how to make that a book. I just, it, it kept sort of being this, um, uh, it was like self-helpy and, you know, like it just, it didn't feel, um, it didn't feel narrative, I guess. And so I just kept at it. I kept writing articles for whomever would take them. And um, it really wasn't until I went out to a prison program in California that I met um, a bunch of guys who were in a domestic violence wing in this prison. And I realized nobody's talking to them. We only talk to the victims, but we don't, we don't really treat the seed of the problem. And I had a researcher say to me something that really stuck with me. He said, you know, people talk about victims being stuck, but we don't ever talk about the perpetrators being stuck. And I began to, to see that as a way in, I guess. And I went back to this prison again and again. They actually, this is so California, they do yoga at the end of the day. Like, that would never happen in the Midwest, like, never. Um, but I began to talk to these guys, and, and, and they, they, they gained a kind of sense of um, their own emotional complexity. I mean, I would, have, I would have these, like, gangbangers from East Oakland say things to me like, yeah, so I was in, they call it Baghdad. Yeah, so I was in Baghdad. I was hanging with my homies, and, you know, I'd call my girlfriend a bitch, and I realized I was really dehumanizing her and taking away her sense of self. And it was like... <laughs> You know, like the professors I work with don't talk like that. And so, um, so I realized that they were kind of a way in for me to, to come at this narratively. I wanted to write something that people would read. It's very easy to turn off questions of domestic violence. Thank you very much. So, um, Stephen, uh, it's a little bit hard to make this transition, except there's a little darkness, a uh, little darkness across the stage. Um, <laughs> But uh, I had the privilege of reading the first volume because it was a finalist for the Pulitzer and um, astonishing uh, piece of work. And this even, um, you know, as vivid and, and uh, well-written as uh, any biography I can remember reading for some time, I decided to just read as many chapters as I could cram in in the time. Uh, who doesn't love a conversation about Hitler and Stalin? Uh, so <laughs> that's one of my subjects. But I want to start with a framing that you use when you're really um, bringing him onto the stage of power at the beginning of collectivization and the, and the great uh, killings. And you sort of say, if I remember it correctly, that it wasn't just that Stalin made collectivization, it was that collectivization made Stalin, that this huge ambition to collectivize agriculture was almost inevitably going to produce a monster, or at least it produced this monster. So talk to us a little bit about the origins of this mass violence in the ideology of, of the party and of, and, and of the ambition uh, that Stalin brought to that ideology at the beginning of the 30s. Thank you. 
First of all, it, how cool is it to win before you've even written the book? <laughs> <laughs> I just wrote another thousand page book and I'm thinking, these guys have won already. What a thrill to join you, but still, Wait, that's we're, way we're cool. cool to write the book? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Anyhow, so I'm still thinking about that. <laughs> and also the subject matter, yeah, obviously, is um, difficult. Okay. Now, make that transition you were saying. So I tried to make the argument in the book, which I discovered in the work, that it wasn't the personality that delivered the politics, but the politics that delivered the personality. In other words, there wasn't something in childhood or youth or background, a place of origin, which would explain to you how someone could take the lives of millions of people on behalf of a cause and keep going as he knew the lives were being lost. So the argument of the book, it, to simplify, is that doing that made him what he then became in stages. And people around him recognized this so that if you follow the commentary on Stalin in real time, not retrospectively, but people who wrote something down about him at the time they observed it, if you look forward that way, they didn't all see a monster at, in the time frame that we usually attribute those uh, characterizations to him. So it came out a little bit later. And so this is what led me to understand this process. So this was, believe it or not, an idealist. This was a guy who believed in social justice, in combating evil. He grew up in Tsarist Russia. He gave up what turned out to be the only job he ever held, which was a weatherman. He was briefly a weatherman. The only legal job he held until he became a tyrant. And he gave that up because the injustice that he saw and he wanted to fight, combat that injustice. And he spent 20 years in the underground in prison, in exile, escaping, going back in. No money, no profession, no prospects. And it hadn't been for World War I and Lenin and the revolution, of course, we properly never would have heard anything about him. But he was part of a struggle, which he kept his whole life. The idea was that um, markets and private property, what we call capitalism, was evil. And so the only way you could build a better world was to eliminate or transcend markets and private property. Back then, there was imperialism, all the colonization across the world. There was World War I, soon after fascism and Nazism, the Great Depression. And in, in that epoch, many people, not just Stalin, could believe that the the only way to get to a better place was to eliminate what they saw as the root. The cost of doing that, the difficulties, the violence of eliminating capitalism through coercion were greater than the original problem that they were addressing. But the motivations were real and sincere, and then, of course, they fold into uh, geopolitics and Russia's place in the world. And, the time period between the world wars, so it's the ideology plus the geopolitics and the institutions. Well, after reading that account of collectivization and how politics made the, the killer, I kind of jumped forward to the internal purges when he, when he starts like killing tens of thousands of NKVD people and military officers yes. and so forth. And one of the themes of that uh, part of the history is that it was easy for him, that you know there was he was there was all of these mechanisms now inside the machine that almost self-generated these purges. So say something about what, what the framing for that inside murder really was. Yeah, so it's not easy to murder nearly a million people who are loyalists and in positions of authority. Eliminate state officials, all local party bosses. Eliminate your ambassador corps. Eliminate your military officers at the very top. Eliminate the police who are eliminating these people and do that while they're eliminating the others. It's just astonishing. 
And yes, he did have the machinery, which had to do with uh, communist ideology and Leninist organization, censorship and closing off the outside world. But the idea that it was class struggle, you only move through violence, history only moved through violence, there were enemies, internal and external, and they linked up. And most of this was part of the original underground conception of the revolutionaries, which then deepened or widened during the revolutionary process. But how, it, it must be said, he was extremely talented, unfortunately, and he was the one who built up a lot of this machinery that then became available for his use. But it's still confounding. I've spent many years now thinking about this, and of course many others before me have worked on this problem. Many extremely impressive historians and political scientists and novelists. Why did he murder those people? Collectivization, we understand that because there was quasi-markets, de facto private property in the countryside, and if you were gonna build socialism by eliminating capitalism, collectivization was necessary to the system. Khrushchev does not repudiate collectivization in 1956 when he repudiates Stalin's rule. He repudiates, however, this so-called great terror, these mass murders in the mid to late 1930s. And in the end, it looks like he had a theory of rule, that this was just the way to rule. He begins to read ancient history more deeply, the various Roman tyrants, Persian tyrants to try to understand how to be a tyrant. It's chilling. The last uh, piece I read uh, was about the run-up to his pact with Hitler um, on the eve of the Second World War. And um, throughout what I read, you keep Hitler on the stage in your treatment of geopolitics for good reason. Hitler's 12 years as junior. Um, the diplomatic history leading up to the pact and then the invasion of Poland is incredibly complicated, very interesting about, you know, he was negotiating with Britain and Germany simultaneously. The Germans were negotiating with Britain and the Soviet Union simultaneously. He had a problem in the East with Japan that figured in his calculation. So tell us a little bit about why it was that he made that shocking decision and, but also how did he think about Hitler at that point on the eve of, of what would become a catastrophe for the Soviet Union? You know, in 1991, when the Soviet Union collapsed, the settlement was imposed on Russia, which was flat on its back. And that settlement was not favorable to Russia, but then again, the Soviet <coughs> Union had dissolved, they lost the Cold War. Russia could do nothing about the 1991 settlement and where the borders were and what the treaties and agreements were. But later on, they came back as a power again, and now they can do stuff about the 1991 settlement, and they're changing it. So we have this before. This is the Versailles Peace Treaty of 1919. The Versailles Peace Treaty was only possible because both Germany and Russia were flat on their back simultaneously, which had never happened since Bismarck's unification in the 1870s and would never happen again. And so this anomalous 1919 period, the peace treaty was imposed on Germany without Russia's participation. Of course, one or both of those could be expected to come back from being flat on their back, and both did within a single generation. So the Versailles peace treaty was DOA before the ink was dry. The British, in the interwar period, recognized this almost immediately, and the British spent the entire interwar period themselves trying to revise the Versailles Treaty to make it more stable, to include Germany, and maybe even to include the Soviet Union. Stalin, for his part, also uh, had a consistent policy in the interwar period, which was based on Marxism-Leninism, and it was as follows. Imperialist war could destroy the Soviet Union 
if the imperialists got together and ganged up on him. However, if the imperialists were divided and fought each other instead, then the Soviet Union would be safe, and maybe socialist revolution would break out in the ruins of war among the imperialists. So Stalin spent the interwar period courting Germany for different reasons from how Britain was courting Germany, but they were both courting Germany throughout the whole time. And Hitler's rise to power in January 1933 changed nothing. The Brits continued this policy of trying to bring Germany into a settlement, infamously known as appeasement. And Stalin continued this attempt to lure the Germans away from the French and the British, which he eventually succeeded in and doing in August 1939 in the pact. And so this kind of courtship of Hitler from the British and the Soviet side made sense from the point of view of the geopolitics and the ideas of the time. Super helpful. Um, all right, we've got uh, 10 minutes. Let me open it up to the, to the floor for a few more questions for anyone. Uh, I imagine there's someone with a microphone, yeah, in the back. So just put your hand up and they'll find you. Lily. I'm just curious when you talk about the, the parallels between 1914 and 1991, when, when you pull forward and think about how the future might look as Russia tries to unravel 1991, what, do you, what, is, what are some of your thoughts? You know, to be honest, I'm not that good at predicting the future. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just getting my stride on dealing with the past. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but I'll say this, uh, we're not in that epoch right now, right? We're not, in, we have authoritarianism tendencies and other issues, tribalism, one could go on, uh, but this is not that time period. We don't have the violence in the politics that was characteristic of that time. The xenophobia, the racism, the anti-Semitism, right? It's kind of like an accordion. And in those days, the accordion was wide open. It was so to the max. Now with the authoritarianism, they open up the xenophobia, they open up the racism and the anti-Semitism a little bit on the accordion, but not like that. However, what's the difference between communism and fascism? The difference is communism is over. Mm -hmm. That's the difference. Mm -hmm. So our kids are going to see a world potentially that I've spent a lot of time studying. Hopefully not, but communism doesn't work for the pigs. You know what Orwell called the pigs in Animal Farm? Uh, they can't own the property de jure. They can't aggrandize wealth the same way. But uh, once you bring back markets and private property, you can keep the authoritarianism and the self-dealing becomes, in a way, legalized the theft. And so the fascism provides a model that works for elites in a way that communism doesn't. So even though socialism is still back on the agenda because socialism is related obviously related to the image and reality of capitalism. As the image and reality of capitalism goes one way, the image and re of socialism kind of goes the other way. We're seeing that, but the deeper tendency, the deeper problem, is that the communism, the, the stuff where the state owns the property and you just get to control it and steal some of it, uh, that didn't work and we're probably not going to see that again. So uh, speaking of fascism, let me ask uh, Chris a question about the 2018 election. Um, <laughs> so there was a primary, I guess, Tuesday in West Virginia in which a cold baron who had been to prison for uh, neglect of safety conditions that had led to the deaths of minors uh, was narrowly or somewhat defeated after uh, the intervention of the president. Um, there's a Democrat. Uh, Joe Manchin in the Senate now who's up for re-election and his fate might have something to do with which party controls the Senate. Um, I, I'm sure he was hoping that Blankenship would win <laughs> so that he could run against him. Um, 
but from your boots on the ground uh, field reporting, uh, what's happening in West Virginia in the relationship of the attitude towards the president? And is there still room for a character like Manchin who has won statewide a couple of times as a Democrat, um, but who, who seems to be the most vulnerable uh, defending incumbent out there in that party? Right. Well, I gave up in November 2016 predicting politics. So, uh, <laughs> you know, no courage. <laughs> honestly, it's, on, it's difficult to say because when I'm in there in West Virginia, I'm just talking with guys about their job. I'm just talking about issues of basic justice and fairness. Mm -hmm. And we're not really talking about that. And, you know, what you hear, I, I hear a lot of um, people who are opposed to environmental regulations, regulation in general, but they also appreciate the fact that the Affordable Care Act gave them a crucial provision that uh, restored a presumption in the law that Ronald Reagan had taken away in 1982 that made it much easier to get black lung benefits. Um, and they actually appreciate in large part and think that the preventive rules that were put in place in 2014 under the Obama administration are seem to be working to help cut dust levels down and prevent this from happening in the future. Now, as far as, as what, what they're going to do in 2018, I mean, your guess is honestly as good as mine. <laughs> Thank you. Um, well, seeing no additional hands in the air, let's transition to another, oh, do we have one? Okay, last question. What's surprising thing among the men? Um, gosh, there's so many. <laughs> One is that um, they don't have a sense of themselves as intimidating. You know, um, they don't have a sense uh, of themselves in terms of a gender role or an expectation. Um, that like, you know, they never think about things like, it's okay for me to be enraged, but not to cry, right? Like mm -hmm. things that are, seem sort of basic. Um, and, and I think the other surprising thing is um, that they, uh, that they feel stuck too, in the same way that victims feel stuck. Like they don't have, um, a constellation available to them in terms of their their emotional range, and once they do get that, not always, but um, if they take it seriously, they will um, learn to be better communicators. But they don't; they just simply don't know. Um, and so that's been surprising to me. You know, the other thing that's really surprising in this. Um, um, you know, the, this came up, I, I did some interviews in the immediate aftermath of the, of the Attorney General Schneiderman story. Um, people seemed surprised that he was an abuser, but people in the field who work with abusers are not at all surprised. Mm -hmm. Only 25% of domestic violence perpetrators are those rageaholics, right? We equate it with anger management. Ray Rice, mm -hmm. you know, gets his charges dropped and gets sent to anger management. But Ray Rice isn't angry. He's about power and control in terms of one person. And so, you know, abusers get victims because they're charming. It's not at all surprising that somebody like Attorney General Schneiderman was able to, to find women to date him. Um, so, I mean, I guess I would say, I guess that's how I would answer that. There's surprise on both ends. That's, that's great. So that's a great transition to John and Jane, but let us thank our panelists for the very thoughtful comment. First of all, Jane, uh, welcome. Uh, I think many of you know Jane Mayer uh, from the book that she co-wrote um, about the Clarence Thomas case. Uh, and she has two recent books that both have the, na the word dark in them, the dark side and dark money. And she's been a reporter for the Wall Street Journal and the New Yorker uh, for some time. I think we first met in 1984 
covering Gary Hart, which you probably you might not even remember that, but I do. Um, so, and most recently, as I think all of you know, uh, she deserves congratulations for two very impactful stories in The New Yorker. Uh, the first one was on the so-called dossier, um, and Christopher Steele, and who he is, and what we should think about him and the dossier. And then the most recent one this week, we were just talking about um, uh, our now former Attorney General, Eric Schneiderman. The first question I would ask you comes from Ayn Rand's book. Uh, remember where she <laughs> says, who is John Galt? <laughs> who is Eric Schneiderman? Wow. Um, well, we don't really answer that question in the piece at all because we're only to writing about this particular aspect of him. Um, and it was sort of a shame in some ways because I, I think he's a very complex character and if it was a bigger profile, there would have been more about why, you know, some insight into why did he behave in this way? Why would someone who sponsored the legislation in the New York Assembly making strangulation a crime um, later be accused by women of assault and of choking them, um, which is exactly what he was turning into a crime? Uh, who is he? I, I, I think... Um, the parts that we didn't go into were that he had a very unhappy upbringing. He was, I grew up in New York City. His parents were divorced when he was very little. Um, his, he was, his father paid very little attention to him growing up. He was um, stuck with his mo mother. He told at least one of these women that she reminded him of she, his mother, and it wasn't a good thing. Uh. Um, <laughs> Uh, I think there was just a lot of unresolved um, issues in his life, and that I, I, I'm, I'm just going on, I didn't interview him for this, I'm going on what these women who were intimate with him serially, he was sort of a, a, a serial monogamist, um, what they said about him was that he was in a lot of pain, he was anesthetizing himself with alcohol and really? tranquilizers pretty much five nights out of seven, um, and meanwhile, performing, I thought, you know, very ably as Attorney General of the State of New York. I had admired him from afar. So this wasn't really a story that gave one great pleasure to do. Um, he seemed like he was doing some very good things in the public arena, but it, they completely were contradicted by what he was doing privately. And we had to grapple with, did it go over the line to a point where the public needed to know this? Well, take us through the process a little bit. How did the story first come to your attention? Well, one of the women, uh, Tanya Selvaratnam, uh, was a classmate at Harvard with a couple people at The New Yorker. And she had a very good friend at The New Yorker, Jennifer Gonerman. And so uh, Jennifer Gonerman sort of was her entree. And, she, and uh, Tanya lit, worked in the same building where The New Yorker is. So she began to confide in, in uh, her friend there, and the story reached David Remnick, the editor. And at some point, he called me. I was busy working on the steel piece, and he said, you know, I just want you to, t just, I've got this story about Schneiderman, and I'm thinking, oh, God, really? Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> and I wasn't really eager to do it at all, but he said, just talk to her. So when I was done with the, the steel piece, I did. And then it didn't, it was remarkable how quickly one woman led to another woman, to another woman, and another woman. And since it's come out, at least two more. So it was just, and each one, as I talked to them, it became these, these really interesting and, I mean, obviously upsetting patterns. But there were tremendous patterns there, even down to his, it, one would describe how he wanted her to remove the, the tattoo on her wrist because it was inappropriate for a potential politician's wife to have a tattoo. And then the next would say, he told me he wanted the scars removed from my torso where I'd had a cancer surgery. And then another would say, he told me I needed you know, plastic surgery for breast enlargements. And then another would be, he told me I needed Botox. He'd pull the skin on my eyes and say, he was like remaking these women through sort of plastic 
you know, controlling them with plastic surgery even from sort of bodily, it was really strange. And they, one by one, they said, you know, I lost 30 pounds. He would control what I ate and um, my hair was falling out and I became emaciated and they'd send pictures and there they were, you could see the bones sort of sticking out in their chest and the cheekbones sticking out. And then, you know, um, and, and then one by one they'd say, he would tell me to drink. He drank an incredible amount. And he'd pour these drinks in lemonade-sized glasses that were hard liquor and hold it up to my mouth like um, a parent with a kid and say, drink, drink, drink it, and to the point where it spilled down on my chest. You know, and, but each one would say the same thing. And these were years apart, but it was going on over and over. And that was not even about the sexual abuse or, you know, it was just a really strange thing to see the Re repetition. Now, had Ronan Farrow been on the story through his Me Too reporting also, and how, how did your reporting well, no, converge so, on this? So Ronan came in late, and thank goodness, um, because I, I don't think I have the appropriate skills for that, that it takes in some ways for a story like this, because it takes an incredible amount of patience and hand-holding. And I'm not used to that. And Ronan has infinite patience with difficult people that he's interviewing. And so I was beginning, we, I, from the start, talking to Tanya, she and her lawyer were on the phone. And I said, I really think at a minimum, we only had one person. I said, we need three people. And I'd like three people on the record. And what happened was, as we were reporting it, one would go on, and then we'd lose another one. And people, they were freaking out. They were so scared. They were so emotional about this thing. And I was sort of being, I, I mean, my, you know, I was sort of like, just cut it out, you know? And I didn't say that, but that was my sort of attitude was just sit tight, we're gonna get this story together, but we need three at least. And just, and, and they, they, Ronan is wonderful at talking to these people and he reassured them. And he told them that it was incredibly important what they were doing. And he was has a wonderful bedside manner, basically. And he's a great, I wasn't sure I'd never worked with him before. He's a really good reporter. He's tireless. Um, he helped get the medical records. Um, he knew just sort of what to do on that. And then I wrote it. Um, so anyway, but it was a good, it was fun working with him. He was really, really great. So early on, and Rachel addressed this issue, and I think everybody knows that women stay, you know, even when they're being beaten, and that's a, been a familiar pattern of domestic abuse. But was there ever a time when you weren't entirely sure whether maybe there was a consensual, um, you know, S and M? dynamic to this or did you know from yeah, the beginning I mean, that it was that was part of my impatience and the problem for me is that I think and I, I don't know if Rachel finds this but that I have a very different attitude towards if someone hit me I I my feeling is they'd be dead you know and so right. um, and so how does somebody get pulled into something like this and does it implicate them in some way then and it 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 was very hard for me to find the full sort of sympathy, and I kept asking them, "Well, why didn't you leave?" You know, and and it takes a real, it was a real education working on this, which much like it sounds like sort of what you went through, which is that 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 Eric, Eric Schneiderman was a very charming guy, as you said. They loved him, um, at least three of them. There are four women here. One of them didn't was not really involved with him. Um, she just he just. Put a, made an advance on her, but and then hit her. But but the uh, but the they were very very invested in the relationship, and it was hard for them to get out of it. And they kept thinking they could change him, fix him, get him therapy. He would make them feel insecure by saying, "You're not liberated enough mm -hmm. to meet my needs, and I'd like to marry you, but you know this isn't working really." And you know, all of these different sort of manipulative strategies that made them feel like they would, you know, they, they, were, they somehow got caught up in it and it got worse and worse. That's the other thing. Is most domestic violence abusers don't start on the first date by hitting somebody. A lot of the people who get hit 
get hit for the first time on their honeymoon. And that was true, I think, of one of Rob Porter's wives that she yeah. told that story. Or a lot of them get hit when uh, the women get hit when they're pregnant. So they're kind of stuck. Now, and these people were not married to him and they weren't pregnant, but they were, they were publicly known as his mate. They were out there um, and they, they, they admired him. And they feel in retrospect that he picked that this business about being such a champion of women um, it, it, they, and being um, a feminist himself, that they felt tricked, like he had the sort of the seal of good housekeeping. And they trusted him. They thought, well, of course he's a great guy. Look at the things he says. He's, he's winning every award from every women's group. And they couldn't really understand. It was confusing. They'd be in bed, and he'd, they'd, he'd suddenly hit them, and hit them again and again. Um, and so, when I really, I mean, it was pretty clear pretty early that he was a monster. But when, when it became crystal clear that there was not a Fifty Shades of Grey backstory that maybe they were covering for was with the fourth, the woman you described as the fourth She's woman key. in, in the right, Hamptons, right. where he doesn't have any kind of, you know, whips and chains relationship with her or whatever. He just takes her off from a party and just whacks her apropos of nothing. nothing. Right. And he uh, and what he says to her I thought was really telling, which was he says, I, I, I know people like you. I, you, you, you. She's a very, very prominent lawyer. High caliber women, with, she's divorced with children. You have to make so many decisions in your life. I know what you really want. You really want a man to be in charge. And, um, and hits her really hard. And, 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 but meanwhile, before that even, he's saying, you know, you're a little slut. You want to be my little whore. And he's saying these things that are incredibly demeaning to her, but he's saying, and after he hits her, I think he realizes, uh-oh, you know, this was a, the, you hit the wrong girl, sort of, to, to um, uh, paraphrase, uh, uh, you know, Edward G. Robinson. And, um, and, he, and, and, she, and he sort of suddenly starts freaking out, realizing she's a really important lawyer in the city, and he's hit her very hard. And, and he says, you know, a lot of women, they don't know they like it, but they really want it. And so that's his, it's this kind of arrogant attitude. You want this. And, and, and basically, no means yes. So, uh, which is so amazing coming from him. But I wanted to say one thing. You said he's a monster. And there was a very interesting essay by Megan McArdle in the Washington Post, who is a, a writer mostly for The Atlantic these days. And she writes about how she had a, a boyfriend who hit her. And she said, it's a mistake to think of them People say they're a monster, but they're actually, in her case, and I think in some ways in Shardman's too, very charming, very accomplished, funny, devoted in many ways. It's the confusion of somebody who seems like they're okay a lot of the time and then has this other side. And they said he sort of clicked into it and became... Um, you know, one of the women, Tanya said, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. And if without the, without the other side of him, um, she wouldn't have been there if he were just obviously like right. that. These are very educated, accomplished women. Well, we'll, you know? we'll no doubt see the movie at some point. In the meantime, you can watch Big Little Lies where... <laughs> right. I still haven't uh, yeah. seen it, but everyone has said, I've got to go see it. So, yeah, okay, um, I mean, watch Nicole it. Nicole Kidman's uh, husband uh, plays the role. Um, I want to talk about dark money um, a little bit. There, there's, um, uh, well, first of all, how do you define dark money? Um, so dark money is kind of the term of art. It wasn't my phrase, but it's, it's, it refers to money being spent in politics where you can't see who's spending it. Um, you can sometimes see what it's buying. You see ads that buys. You can see its influence, but you can't finally trace it back to its origins. But you also cover in this really fine book um, that pulls together a lot about and explains a lot about what's happened to our politics uh, in the last 30 years. Um, you also have some money that's not quite dark because you know it's the Koch brothers and you know it's, it's you know, Richard Mellon Scaife and, and, but that doesn't make it any less insidious. And I wanted to kind of bring the story forward. The book came out in 2016. Um, so 
the Koch brothers at one of the conferences that you chronicle earlier that they have at a resort in California or Colorado every year, and sometimes there is a tape that leaks out about what is said, but they have a network, and it's not just their money, it's a lot of their friends' money, and in January of this year, they pledged $400 million. For the midterms. For the midterms. Uh, now, just to give you a sense, there's a story in the New York Times today about some uh, moderate Democrats who are trying to uh, raise, uh, I think it's about $30 million, right, um, in $108,000 increments. Um, is, do you have any sense of whether that $400 million um, plus the $30 million that Sheldon Adelson has pledged, are they waiting until after Labor Day to just pour a huge mountain of cash on top of all of these Democratic candidates? Or have they already spent some of it? Or might they not end up spending some of it because of other factors? Uh, I think they'll spend it. I mean, this is incredibly important to them. In, merely more important than the presidency for the Kochs is, is owning Congress, because that's where so many laws are passed that affect their business. So um, the, the, it, 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 it really works for them to, to own the Hill. And um, so uh, the, if you look at what they did in 2014, the, the last midterm election, they spent early, which is what um, is, is, it's not just in the last few minutes. They really have a whole infrastructure that in many ways is much more powerful than the Republican National Committee, and it has more employees, spends more money. Um, it includes going door to door all over the country. They've got sort of nodes of their own organization, Americans for Prosperity. I think it's in, in, uh, it's in almost every state now. Um, so they've got a kind of an organizational model that's like, um, um, it's, like a, it's, it's like a major national party but it's funded by about 400 of the richest conservatives in the country. So do you think the conventional wisdom is wrong, that the Democrats, because of the energy, because of dislike for Trump, will take the House? No, I, I'm actually very optimistic that the Democrats, and I am a Democrat, will um, take um, the House back. And um, I, I, I just, I, I, I think that uh, there's just such an outpouring of, of, of activism as a result of Trump. I think people may be motivated by just putting a check on him to, to that, 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 you know, the idea that he's got both houses of Congress, the court, um, and the White House, I think is enough to, if we've seen, you know, the early races we've seen in Virginia and other places, huge turnout. It's all gonna be about turnout. If the Democrats can get their turnout, they will, I think they'll, they'll take it back. Even though the history is that it, in state and local races, the candidate with the most money wins, generally wins. O overwhelming percentage of the time. That, that's, that's generally true, but there are also, I mean, at this point, also a lot of Democrats pouring money in. There's a sort of, maybe not, not quite on the size of the Kochs, they're certainly not making donations of the size of the Kochs, but there are a lot of motivated Democrats we've seen pouring money into these races. So. <laughs> I, I, and also, you know, congressional races are less expensive than presidential races. You write about the corruption of academia, not Columbia, but a lot of other schools that could be. I don't know what have been yeah. pretty, uh -huh. pretty corrupted by this Koch brothers money that, you know, is really is dark because it's all these institutes that nobody knows that they're actually controlling the professors who are appointed uh, to be in these institutes. But now, as a result of your book and other work, do you think that um, people's consciousness has been raised enough on this? And there was just an issue at George, Wa George Mason University. Do you think there's a counter effort now among woke uh, people to uh, identify the dark money and combat it? Well, I mean, there, it, there is an effort. There's an organization called Uncoke My Campus. And that's what was working at George Mason. And at Wellesley, there's been a huge fight going on. There's, the Kochs now have funded um, centers in somewhere between 300 and 350 colleges and universities that are pushing sort of free market ideology under the guise of it being um, 
just about uh, you know uh, freedom of expression and freedom of ideas on campus. Um, they say that the campuses are politically correct and they need to personally fund all of this in order to make sure that this ideology gets just a little bit of um, airing. So um, they're doing this all over the country and it, it's, it varies depending on which part of the country how, how woke they were. I was down speaking at um, the University of Texas in Austin recently and they had a brand new Coke Center that was just opening and um, it's amazing how little people understood about what's about it. They they said, "Oh well, it's just about freedom of expression, and you know, we just thought it was a good thing." And there's so much money behind it; it's very hard for these places to turn away the money. And so um, then they were shocked that um, they had a debate, and the head of the center debated some of the people on the faculty, and they were the 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 pre-existing faculty were blown away by how right-wing they were. And these were conservative people, but they'd never seen anything quite like what the ideology was that's coming into these centers. So um, so it's happening all over the country. It's, a, it's I think there's more of a fight now than there was when I wrote the book, but most places just take the money. And talk about Ann Rand. Some of them, um, Ann Rand, whatever, I never know how to pronounce her first name. But, but at any rate, there are places where when you take the money, you literally have to agree to teach Ayn Rand. Um, and there's, you know, and there are schools that are in kind of difficult economic positions. One was a Quaker school. And so suddenly all these Quakers are learning about, you know, Atlas Shrugged. Um, <laughs> probably in so, Janesville too. The, probably. You know, Amy, Amy's well, book. I mean, Paul Ryan yeah, was, is from, there. From Janesville. You know, worked so closely with the Cokes. Um, so. so I just want to ask you before we open it up one question about the dark side, which won the J. Anthony Lucas Award in 2009. Um, uh, Gina Has Haspel, um, what do you know about the dark side? that she uh, supervised, and how do you sort out her level um, of responsibility for destroying the tapes of the torture that took place there? Well, I mean, the, she was in Thailand, and that was the site that she supervised, and it was a place where some of the early and worst things happened. Terrible waterboarding situation there. Um, people being waterboarded over and over and over and over again. Um, and same, the same people. And long past the time when it was clear they didn't know anything. And so um, the reason that they destroyed the tapes, and I write about this in the book, was that there was a consensus among those who'd seen them that they, if they were released, it would be unsurvivable for the program. And there would be such an outcry because it was so horrific to see what was going on. And they knew that they couldn't afford to have these tapes come out. And that's, and that's coming from people inside the CIA. So they're saying, so they, so they get rid of the evidence. And it's one thing to write about it and another thing to actually see it. It's, it's just, it was so horrible. So, um, so Haspel, she, she issued, she, transmitted the order to get rid of the, the uh, tapes and destroy the evidence. And what she's basically arguing was, I followed the orders. Um, and um, was that it had been okayed by lawyers. And um, so she was just being a good employee doing this. And I, I, to, to my mind, I think that's a, um, a tremendous danger with a president like Trump. Because she's saying now, I would never do this again. But if she's someone who saw her job as following the orders, um, there's been no evidence that she acted in along any independent ethical standards at all. Um, so so. Be, it's pretty clear that Trump appointed her in part because she did this, not in spite of her having done this. Uh, so the signal that this sends around the world, do you think that it will? increase the amount of torture in, to in total that goes on around the world? And will Americans who are taken hostage or prisoner be more vulnerable to torture now that the US government, if she's confirmed, is very much on the record supporting, as Trump said during the campaign, more waterboarding? Yes, I mean, I don't uh, think that the US is about to go back to doing it. But when you have 
someone who was so deeply involved in it, running the CIA, of course it gives the message it sends the world is we're okay with that. Um, it's, it, maybe it wasn't the right thing, we're not doing it anymore, but how bad could it be if she wasn't far from being fired, she's been made director. Um, so that gives permission to places like Syria, to um, Egypt, all these places in the world that have horrific histories of, of torture to, you know, we, we have no standing at this point to, to tell them that that's a violation of the Geneva Conventions um, because we've just promoted someone who destroyed the evidence of our own torture program and hasn't, com she really hasn't completely condemned it. She sort of said it was a hard time, um, but she hasn't, as the New York Times wrote today, said the one thing that everybody really wants to hear her say, which was it was morally wrong and we should have never done it. And John McCain said it was disqualifying her refusal to McCain's do that. McCain's been fantastic yeah. about it. Um, okay, I think we have time for about you know five or ten minutes of questions uh, for Jane. Um, Thank you. Um, my name is Philip Turner. About the Cokes and the Mercers, if I may, I've read Dark Money, and I, I, at the, about the time I read it is when the Mercers were emerging into a consciousness, news consciousness more and more. And with the Cokes, while I, I don't like what they do, I never felt they were actually trying or willing to uh, consort with foreign uh, uh, agents against the country, while with the Mercers, I see that they've been more willing to. I know you wouldn't want to write another book on dark money, but, but how do you see the Mercers amid all this? Well, I, di I did a profile for The New Yorker about Robert Mercer, and um, um, he's a really odd person. I mean, basically, <laughs> he's someone who said he would rather spend his life with cats than people, which maybe is not so odd, but I'm a dog person. But, um, <laughs> uh, but he, he doesn't like to speak to people. He's a very, very reclusive, very brilliant computer scientist with kind of no understanding of, no, 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 I don't think he's got a lot of knowledge about politics, but he has very, very strong ideas. And he, he reads very eccentric things. He would believe that Hillary Clinton literally murdered people from the, the things that he was reading. And, um, and he um, thinks that, you know, he's got very extreme views on things like civil rights. He thought the civil rights era was the biggest mistake in American history. And, um, and it, he basically thinks that humans are, should be valued on the basis of what they earn. So those who earn the most money are the most valuable to society. And those who are on welfare have negative value. Um, and so um, he mostly also wanted to just defeat Hillary Clinton. That was how he got involved in this whole thing in the first place in this last election. But um, well, I, I, I mean, I just think of, that he's an example of someone who, if he didn't have almost a billion dollars, I think he's probably at about a billion, you, nobody would pay him any mind. I mean, he's got really, he's kooky, kooky views. And it, but because of our system, he has an inordinate amount of power. Now, uh, Rebecca Mercer's daughter is all tied up with Cambridge Analytica. After the scandal broke, um, there were some stories that she was going to be sidelined in this cycle. Do you think that's true? I, I just don't know. I mean, it, it's, it's, I don't think Trump, tr they basically helped fund him in a way that got, helped get him over the line. They brought in Bannon. This is uh, Rebecca right. and her father. And, um, and Kellyanne Conway and a few other people, and Cambridge Analytica, and it helped get Trump over the finish line. But I don't think Trump ever liked them. Um, it's, people, when you interview them about the Mercers, I, I have yet to come across anyone who says, oh, they're delightful. <laughs> <laughs> so, She's sort of like they, Angela Lansbury in the Manchurian Candidate. Yeah. Sort of. <laughs> well, yeah. it could, you know, I don't know if she's quite like that, but she's, I mean, they're, they're bright, but, they're, but the people find them really hard to take. And, um, but their money is pretty um, helpful. So, it's, it, so anyway, will they be involved in this cycle? I don't know. I, I, I assume so. They originally 
linked up with the Cokes. That's why they're in dark money. They were in that group. And then they wanted to do their own thing because they were impatient that the Cokes weren't getting changed fast enough. So they then got behind Trump when the Cokes didn't. And are there these junior Cokes who go to the conferences in California uh, who, not, not Koch family members, but people who are going to be with us long after the Koch brothers are dead, who will be funding these Republican I mean, there certainly candidates. are, you know, zealous you know, libertarians and free marketeers and all that kind of thing. I actually think that Charles Koch, who is really the protean figure of the Koch brothers, is a kind of a one-of-a-kind character, and there w I'm sure there'll be other big players, but he, he you, you could give him credit for being very much... Um, having put his imprint on this because of who he is. He's amazingly, um, he, he, he thinks systematically like an engineer. He looked at the American political system and he spent 40 years thinking, how do I take this thing over? How do I re-engineer it to make, it, make this country the kind of extreme libertarian um, paradise that I believe in? And um, so, and it's a lot of it is through what you were alluding to before. It's money spent not just on elections. Elections are in some ways the least of it. It's spent on this ideological assembly line, professors, uh, uh, studies that are sort of come out with phony things saying that global warming is not real, um, all kinds of um, political groups that seem to be citizens groups that actually are all paid for by people, fake, you know, astroturf groups. ALEC, which is introducing bills all over the country at the legislative level. It's a, it's a system, it's really a machine that they built in. And, and I don't see anyone else quite like Charles Koch building a machine like that right now. American Legislative Exchange Council, ALEC, good thing to get familiar with if you haven't heard of it the state level, it's very powerful. Um, somebody, yes? Why doesn't the left have a Charles Koch? I'm sorry, what was the... Why doesn't the left have a Charles Koch? I mean, there's George Soros and Bill Gates I mean, and Warren Buffett and all of these extraordinarily wealthy and also systematic thinking folks. Why isn't there somebody like that on the left? Well, I mean, you, you could argue that, I mean, they do argue on the right that Soros is the closest, but Soros has spent a lot of money in Europe um, trying to do, you know, fund democracy movements in the part of the world that he grew up in, Hungary and elsewhere, and obviously it's not come out very well for him um, there. But, um, you know, he, he I, I, Charles Koch came from a place that was so far out on the fringe and felt that, um, he, I mean, he was, he was described by, by William F. Buckley as an anarcho-totalitarian. He was so, he was a joke, basically, when he started. And now he's at the center of the Republican Party in this country. So, the, meanwhile, the Democrats, he, from his standpoint, were the establishment. They didn't, and the Democrats didn't feel they needed to build a movement. They kind of owned the, the, the press and the academia and at least, the, you know, sort of centrism and, and you know, liberalism did. Um, and, and so they didn't feel they needed to build up a counter-establishment. Charles Koch wanted to take it over. Um, so he built up his own press and his own academia and, and all of these organizations. Um, so maybe if the Democrats feel endangered enough, they'll do the same. Anybody else? Um, yes. There's a reporting from Spencer Ackerman in the Daily East that there are additional recordings that, that's okay, I'm very loud. Um, oh, oh. Um, there's reporting from Spencer Ackerman in the Daily Beast that there are additional recordings of the torture sessions in Thailand that Gina Haspel wasn't able to destroy. Is that something you've heard as well? And I guess this is wild speculation, but do you think those tapes will ever see the light of day? I, I don't know about it. It, it. it doesn't surprise me as a possibility because they recorded everything. It was, it was uh, one of the things I couldn't believe when I was doing the book was, in the beginning anyway, was that it was so meticulous and deliberate and it was there were there were scientists and doctors, psychologists measuring to make sure that when they waterboarded people, they'd put you know measure their oxygen level so that 
they didn't die, but they'd go right up to the edge of dying. It was, and so it wouldn't surprise me if there were other, certainly records um, and cables. And I, I don't know if there are more videotapes, but it, 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 there was, most of these people were on, there were cameras on them in all of these sessions all over the world. One thing you can always bet that there's video. <laughs> you know, there's so many examples of where people have tried to destroy the video and then it turns up. And Khalid Sheikh Mohammed was tortured, I believe, it was 88 times, waterboarded 88 times. So it's quite possible maybe one of those A lot tapes of tapes survive. to destroy. The CIA can be incompetent when it comes to all kinds of things, probably including destroying the tapes. Um, so I think uh, we're just about out of time. Oh, we got one, one more. Abby. Thank you so much, Jane. Um, in terms of your contact, we hear a lot about accusations made against the deep state fighting against the Trump administration. In terms of your contacts with life, people who've worked in the State Department or CIA, you know, career people, how is morale these days? Um, oh. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about even with a you know a new head of the CIA coming, how how are these people doing? I mean, I think the morale is just terrible. But and 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 it's not just at the you know in the higher levels, but so many of the lower level public servants are um, being laid off and trashed. And I mean, I really see you know the, the, to sort of back up what's going on right now. Everybody said that at the end of, of, of 2016, that the, the Kochs hadn't won because the candidate they didn't back, Trump, won. Um, but I see so much of his, first of all, his idi the Koch ideology is sort of triumphant, this idea that government is the enemy, the deep state, which means basically people with experience in government are, is the enemy, um, experts are the enemy, and the press is the enemy. All of this was stuff that was, you know, important to the, to the sort of the Koch ideology. And their people have, it's amazing, but they've so infiltrated the Koch administration. They're in so many key positions, Wilbur, including- Wilbur Ross, Commerce Secretary is a Koch guy, right? Mike Pence. Mike the, Pence. Standing there in the wings, just waiting. Um, and, and, but they're, they're, they really, they're, they're just sort of, in so many key positions um, at the EPA, obviously Scott Pruitt is their person, and so we're levels down. If you look at it, so many people literally worked for Coke Industries um, or, or been their lobbyists, and they're all, all over the place. And the ideology is that government is the enemy and that only the free market works, and that regulations are, are you know, de deleterious to the economy. and. Um, and it's 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 the sort of the battle cry now. Um, so, it's it's we don't live that far from the White House, and you sort of feel it day in and day out. And I think it's affecting the morale of a, a whole lot of people. But um, but I've got to say I got to hand it to the the press. I really think since we're here at the journalism school, I think the reporting has been remarkable from so many places, and that people have really risen to the challenge. Um, they've kept their professionalism under incredible circumstances and turned out one amazing story after the next, after the next, you know, and they just keep doing it. And the newspaper war in Washington between the Times and the Post has been, uh, like, I've, it, it, sometimes it's just like a rat-a-tat thing every day that makes you think you're back in the days of the front page. So, um, so there's some good news. <laughs> On that note, thank you very much, Jane. Thanks for coming. <laughs>